Bizarre rules that old Hollywood stars were forced to obey. During the golden age of Hollywood, movie studios ruled the roost. Their star system produced iconic actors and actresses that lit up the box office. But they also controlled the personal and professional lives of the screen legends at the time. The clauses in A-listers' contracts were extremely prohibitive, and they were also constrained in what they could do on screen by Hollywood's self-censoring Hays Code. You had to sign a long-term contract with one movie studio. Movie studio talent scouts could sign people off the street to long-term contracts based almost entirely on their looks. It didn't matter if they had acting experience or not. These contracts tended to last anywhere from four to seven years. The prospective star effectively became the studio's property, free to be molded any way their bosses saw fit. You couldn't work for another studio while under contract unless officially loaned out. Unlike today's movie stars who are generally free to work on projects with a variety of studios, old Hollywood stars were forbidden from working for studios other than the one to which they were contracted. That is, unless the studios in question worked out an official loan deal. Elizabeth Taylor was famous for pushing for these deals as it enabled her to work on more challenging projects. You couldn't say no easily if the studio wanted you to play a role. If a star had been earmarked by the studio for a particular role, it was expected that they would do what they were told. Saying no was not an impossibility, but it could lead to the studio making their life difficult. For example, in the late 1930s, Betty Davis was benched by Warner Brothers for refusing the roles they offered her. She wound up suing the studio. You were likely to be given a stage name. Today, most Hollywood actors and actresses are known by their real names, but in the days of the studio system, Many of them were forced to adopt stage names the studio deemed more marketable. For example, Lucille Lesueur became Joan Crawford, Norma Jean Mortensen became Marilyn Monroe, and Archibald Leach became Cary Grant. You could even be given a fake backstory. Louis B. Mayer, co-founder of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, once said, A star is made, created, carefully and cold-bloodedly built up from nothing. The studios would pick a persona, such as the girl next door or teenage rebel without a cause, and market that to the audience. In some instances, they would even go further and invent fabricated backgrounds for their actors and actresses. Stars were sometimes given plastic surgery. Movie stars having plastic surgery is still fairly commonplace today, but in old Hollywood, the practice was arguably even more extreme. For example, Rita Hayworth was born Margarita Carmen Cancino, and her father had Spanish heritage. In order to make it in Hollywood, she had her skin lightened and endured a year of electrolysis treatment to alter her naturally low Latina hairline, making it an inch higher. Their weight was also strictly controlled by the studio. It was standard practice to include weight maintenance in a star's contract, and these studios also pushed for their stars to stay physically fit at all times. Marlene Dietrich was one of the first actresses to be publicly encouraged to lose weight by her studio. She exercised and also went on to an extreme diet consisting of cottage cheese, broth, and toast. The studio dress code discouraged women from wearing pants. Katherine Hepburn was a star who often fought back against the studio's influence. For instance, the costume department at RKO Pictures once took away her pants as they were considered too boyish for their female starlets to wear. Hepburn responded by coming to set in her underwear railing against putting her clothes back on until she was allowed to wear her pants again. Contracted actors often took acting and voice lessons. Louis B. Mayer said, All I ever looked for was a face. If someone looked good to me, I'd have him tested. If a person looked good on film, if he photographed well, we could do the rest. This looks over ability approach led to many non-actors being signed to major studios. Therefore, it was common for these young stars to be sent to acting and voice lessons. Many were also sent to horseback riding, fencing, and dance lessons. On top of acting lessons, prospective stars were often given lessons in other disciplines, with the end goal of making them better all-around entertainers. After all, the idea was to transform these young people into multi-talented stars with true screen presence. To that end, horse riding, dancing, and even fencing lessons were therefore commonplace. Male stars had to exude the public image of gentlemen, Female stars weren't the only ones being controlled by the studio. The male stars were expected at all times to present the image of debonair gentlemen to the public. 
if they became embroiled in anything unseemly in their personal lives, such as a divorce or an affair, this would have to be covered up and could affect their standing with the studio. If you violated the studio's morality clauses, you could be fired. Studios were ruthless if a star somehow violated the image they wanted portrayed to the world. Clara Bow was one of the most famous actresses of the silent film era and made a mammoth 58 movies between 1922 and 1933. However, despite her persona being that of a sex symbol, real-life rumors of promiscuity convinced Paramount to fire her from her contract. Time off was totally at the mercy of the studio. Studios dictated what their stars did and when they took time off. They could also be vindictive if a star defied them in any way. In 1941, a 19-year-old Judy Garland married David Rose, a musician, and MGM was not happy about it. It exerted its power and forced her to come back to work a mere 24 hours after the wedding, preventing Garland and Rose from going on honeymoon. The studio often pretended stars were dating in order to promote their movies. Studio influence over their stars even extended into their love lives. Sometimes in order to promote a film, the studio would organize a sham date between the two stars. For example, Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland publicly went on dates while Babes in Arms was being marketed, despite Rooney being a known Hollywood Lothario. Even a real-life wedding could double as a promotional stunt for a movie. In 1950, an 18-year-old Elizabeth Taylor married Conrad Hilton, heir to the Hilton Hotels empire. The wedding was entirely paid for by MGM and featured a guest list that included some of the biggest names in Hollywood, including Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. The nuptials were nicely timed to coincide with the release of Taylor's latest film, the wedding-themed Father of the Bride. Studios could force LGBTQ actors into heterosexual marriages. In 1955, screen heartthrob Rock Hudson married Phyllis Gates, who was his agent, Harry Wilson's secretary. They would divorce after only three years. It would later come to light that Wilson had arranged the marriage to disguise the fact that Hudson was a homosexual. It wouldn't be until 1985, when he was diagnosed with AIDS, that Hudson bravely revealed his homosexuality to the world. The studio could even veto a marriage if it would affect a star's appeal. Gene Harlow only worked in Hollywood for nine short years, but became an icon during that time. The original blonde bombshell began a relationship with fellow MGM star William Powell in 1934, but the studio was able to veto the couple marrying due to a morality clause in her contract. It allegedly believed that being a wife would change Harlow's sex appeal to the common man. Marriages from before becoming a star were often kept secret. In 1935, it was discovered that in 1911, a 17-year-old Mae West had married a man named Frank Wallace in Milwaukee. This risked affecting her sex symbol image and also pointed to her being older than people thought. She repeatedly denied the marriage, even saying she had no idea who Wallace was, before eventually admitting it after he filed a lawsuit. Babies were often prohibited in female stars' contracts. In her autobiography, Ava, My Story, Ava Gardner wrote that MGM had all sorts of penalty clauses about their stars having babies. Horrifyingly, this led to many actresses of the time having abortions. According to website Ranker.com, when Gardner had an abortion during her marriage to Frank Sinatra in the 1950s, she reportedly did it because she was afraid the studio would cut off her salary if she had the baby. The world is filled with stories going viral every single day. But how many of these sites can you actually follow? We understand that your day should start with positive stories, stories that resonate with you. And so we started JoJo Stories. Our mission is to create meaningful stories that cover everything from animals to anthropology, history to environment and lifestyle. The kind of content you read on our site will be one you'll want to share with your family and friends. We hope you'll join our growing family and be part of our community. Welcome to JoJo Stories. JoJoStories.com